Welcome to Brewing TV, everybody. I'm your host, Jake Keeler. I'm your other host, Michael Doss. This is a very special episode for us. And do you know why? It's our anniversary. Didn't get you anything, I'm sorry. <sighs> Typical. Happy anniversary, Mike. Happy anniversary to you too, Kate. If I could hug Chip. the viewers, I would hug the viewers. Thanks, viewers. Thanks, viewers. And Chip, too. We'll give him a hug later. Off camera. A lot of people talking. Few of them know. Cask conditioned ale. What makes it go? A few weeks ago, we came here to Summit Brewing, where head cask hooligan Damien McCann showed us the ropes and let us run wild on a casking day of his gold sovereign ale, getting our hands sanitized. <laughs> That's right. He put us to task. We filled some casks, we hammered some bungs, and in the end, I think we did pretty good. We hammered those bungs hard. Join us and learn with us here at Summit. All for brew. Brew for all. Happy anniversary. Happy anniversary, man. Cheers. Cheers, Cheers. to you, Chip. And all the viewers. So uh, before we obviously uh, sanitize or rack any beer into our cast, we've got to clean it first. Um, and here at Summit, we use a, uh, a cask washer, specially designed by Microdat, a company out of Leeds in Yorkshire, um, and they specialize in cask and keg cleaning equipment for the primarily for the UK brewing industry. But because we have so many casks here at Summit. We decided it'd be a lot more efficient if we actually brought in one of their machines, which is purposely designed for the job of cleaning casks. Very, very simple machine, um, very efficient and easy to operate. So we're working, uh, going to work with a couple of firkins here today. And we just basically pop our, uh, our firkin on top of the washer like so. Basically what we're going to do is a pre-rinse, caustic wash, and then a rinse at the end. Pretty simple. So we'll fire her up. So the first pre-rinse goes to the drain. This trap door here with the slide gate leads directly to the drain. Then we're gonna recycle the pre-rinse into the first reservoir. Then we're gonna switch over to the detergent reservoir and actually do a caustic clean on the cast. Cool. Yeah. Damien, is this pretty standard issue for breweries that do cask beer in the US? Uh, it'd be fairly uncommon that, that a US cask uh, producer would have a machine like this. Um, there are other ways of cleaning a cask, fairly simple, using spray balls and pumps, and that's what a lot of US brewers will use. This is uh, specifically designed, it's very efficient, it saves on water, energy, um, labor costs, and it's very, very good at what it does. It gets the casks really nice and clean. I'm gonna add my detergent. We aim for about a two and a half percent cleaning solution, hydrogen peroxide solution, to help blast off any soil that might be in there. So now we've just finished our caustic wash. We can see we're now on the hot water wash. We do a quick recycle into the caustic reservoir, and then we start recycling our rinse water, our final rinse water, into the pre-rinse reservoir. So we're trying to recycle as much water as possible. You can't sanitize until you've cleaned, so once we're clean, we're ready to go and sanitize and move on from there. So after we've finished washing the cask, um, we'll sanitize the cask. What we'll first do is add our keystone bung. Literally, we would just drive the bung in to the keystone bushing. Fill the cask through the shive opening. We use a parasitic acid sanitizer for all of our casks. We also use it on bright beer tanks. Uh, we're going to make our additions. We're going to add some priming solution. Make sure we've got a good solid secondary fermentation taking place in the cask. Uh, we'll add our uh, isinglass finings. It's going to encourage our yeast to drop out. So we'll have nice uh, bright beer coming to the beer engine. And then we'll add some dry hops. Today we're going to use some, uh, some Glacier in this cask, a, a really good American hop, perfect for uh, dry hopping casks with. So first thing we'll do is we'll remove this, uh, this shive bung here. We want to take our sanitized funnel. And we'll add our uh, priming solution. And this contains both uh, fresh wort and yeast. And we'll add about uh, about 400 milliliters, roughly a pint, just under a pint, priming solution. It's about a 15 Plato solution. It's also got some nice fresh yeast in it, so we're going to have some really good viable yeast to ensure we get that solid secondary fermentation going on. So that's about 400 mils. Quickly then add a rising glass. 
Isinglass, of course, has been used in uh, cascale production for hundreds of years. Purified form of collagen derived from the swim bladder of uh, tropical fish. Very, very effective clarifying agent. The nice thing about uh, Isinglass is it works a number of times. In fact, it usually works better on the second or third effort to clarify the beer, um, as opposed to, say, gelatin or some other findings that typically only work well once. So we've made our Isinglass edition. We've made our prime edition. We're going to add some dry hops. We're going to use Glacier, really good U.S. variety. Um, it's got some nice uh, fuggal heritage to it. And these are half ounce plugs. So obviously we can get a good idea of exactly how much we're, uh, we're using in terms of our dry hop rate. And we'll use about an ounce and a half there today. And I like to use whole leaf hops over pellets. They, uh, they just, to me, they give a cleaner flavor and aroma. Um, obviously a lot of breweries dry hop with the hop pellets and get great results. But uh, for me, it's just a little bit easier to work with the plugs in our cask. So put our sanitized shive bunk back in our, into the shive opening. And then we can take this into the, uh, the, the, uh, the cask cellar room and we'll be able to uh, rack some green beer in here. Let's wander over there and uh, we'll, uh, we'll get you guys a little dirty and uh, get some work out of you today. <laughs> Summit Brewing was set up really well to produce um, ale and lager that's filtered, bottled in kegs or, or packaged in kegs or, or placed in bottles. Uh, not really well set up for producing cask beer, uh, which is fair enough. Uh, the plan when they built this brewery in 98 was not exactly to do a lot of cask conditioning. Uh, so we've had to adapt a little bit to our circumstances. So this room here, we're using yeast propagation tanks We've got a wort chiller over there. In a, in a purpose-built facility for cask ale, we'd obviously be doing this in a specialized room with the, uh, the appropriate equipment. But a lot of uh, American craft brewers have to uh, kind of adapt and improvise a wee bit. And we're fortunate that we've got some nice equipment that will double for, for our purposes. Cask ale is you know, one of the ultimate forms of, of craft beer. Um, certainly the UK's greatest uh, contribution to the world of craft beer. And I think we'll just see more and more of it as craft beer in the States continues to rise in popularity. I think it's inevitable. People really appreciate the, you know, the, the, the craftsmanship, the flavor that results from cask conditioning beer. And a lot, of, a lot of styles that are very popular in the US today, such as India Pale Ale, Porter, I mean, they were originally served completely cask conditioned. That's, that's how the, the, the style evolved. So we're just going back to the roots of craft beer in many ways when we're when producing these casks. This is the fun part, my man, as many as it takes. A couple, couple of light ones to square it up and there you go. And then 
and right down in the center. Looks pretty good. That looks okay. Maybe a little bit more on this side. I can see that outer edge just topping up. Perfect. All right. Let's walk her over to the palette and uh, start working on the next one. It's that, it's that living aspect that, that's really interesting. You know, it takes a wee while for the beer to mature and condition in the cask. You hit this sweet spot when ideally the cask is served, and then over a period of time, the flavor of the cask will start to deteriorate a wee bit. So not as stable as a filtered keg product or a pasteurized keg product, but it has the potential for a lot more flavor because you can serve the beer at the peak of its condition, the peak of freshness, when it's got its most flavor, and uh, it's a living beer. It's got that yeast activity in there that really adds an extra dimension, I think, to the overall character of the beer. You know, one of the things that a lot of UK brewers will say is that about 65, 70% of, of the work involved in producing the beer takes place at the brewery. But there's that important quarter, 35%, whatever it is, that takes place at the pub cellar and at the bar. Right. You know, and it's a little easier in the UK when you have specialized trained cellar people at these pubs yep. that can handle the cast and know when to put on which type of cast, make adjustments in terms of fining or priming or whatever. Here in the States, we're not up to that level of, uh, of experience and expertise yet, but we're certainly getting there. I like it. Good effort. They're going to sit back there for about a week to 10 days, depending on the beer. Make sure we get a nice uh, secondary fermentation taking place. And then eventually we'll move them back to shipping and receiving for uh, shipping out to the, the wholesalers and onto the trade. All right. Great. Thanks for your help, lads. Nice job. Off to the bar. Sounds good to me. So uh, we've got a cask of our Gold Sovereign here today, and we're just going to pour a couple of glasses off, and we'll see how it compares to the, uh, the standard keg version that we've got also on the bar right behind us. Um, we've got a little pin that was uh, vented about a couple of days ago. I tapped it this morning. Um, it's dry hop with uh, actual whole leaf Sovereign hops from the UK. Sovereign's a fairly new variety, a descendant of Fuggle. Uh, a dwarf hop came out about four years ago. So it'll be interesting to see how the hops in the cask and the cask condition version compares to the, uh, the standard unfiltered version that we have uh, pouring at the bar right now. Gold Sovereign is a modern recreation of a Victorian pale ale. Um, recipe is rooted in the 1870s. And uh, I thought it'd be, it might be kind of fun to take some 21st century ingredients and blend them in on top of that, that 19th century framework, that 19th century recipe. Um, so we, uh, we found some floor malted organic Westminster malt from Chris Malting in Norfolk. We also got some hops in the UK, uh, some First Gold, Pilgrim, some um, Sovereign, and uh, a little bit of Bodicea. Uh, these hops have pretty much only become available in the last couple of years. And my goal was to try and give an idea of what um, the UK is producing right now in terms of modern varieties of hops and malts, and also give an idea of what perhaps uh, pale ales were like back in uh, back in Victorian times. We'll try and get some uh, reaction from the lads and uh, go from there. All right, lads. So we've got uh, we've got a couple of gold sovereigns here for you to try. The first three out front. That's the uh, standard unfiltered keg version. Three behind are the cast condition version that I just poured with the beer engine. Mm -hmm. um, so it'll be just interesting to get your uh, your take on the differences between the two. Ways of maturing and serving the beer, and uh, you don't have to like either. You don't have to dislike either. It's up to <laughs> you, boys. 
Going for the keg version first. Okay, I'm going to go for the cask I'm version going first. Cask. All right. Slauncher, yes. lads. Thanks for your help today, Slauncher. by the way. So I'm getting a lot of uh, breadiness uh, in the cask version. It's more malt. Uh, the malt. The malt character seems to have come out a little bit more in the cask version. Now we're using, um, obviously we were, it's a cask beer, it's going to have lower carbonation level. So a softer kind of a profile. That, mm -hmm bite from the CO2 isn't as obvious in the cask version. Isn't that nice? Um, it's very, very smooth. Um, we're using a tight sparkler on the beer engine to try and um, get the purists going here, drive them nuts. But uh, <laughs> uh, um, I, I think it really adds to the, the overall body of the beer. Um, mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a really interesting malt aroma to it too. Yeah, and there's, there's, a, there's some yeast there's character too coming out. The breadiness to this one, mm -hmm. more, uh, more malt forward. Right. Keg beer is certainly hot forward. Mm -hmm. Right, it's right. It's a little colder too. This is right, that's true, yeah. I um, like what it does to the hop character too. Um, you know, it's a little more herbal. Yeah. And vegetal in a good way. Yeah. This Spicy. one was dry hopped with. This is sovereign, whole leaf sovereign. sovereign. Okay. Um, and of course, the, the unfiltered keg version is dry hopped primarily with first gold. Okay. So we've also got those two right. variables in play. Um, but for me, the malt character is really popping in the cask version. Yeah. So, Damien, what's your personal take on using well, sparkler? Well, being a good Irish lad, I tend to be um, a bit of a um, cantankerous, mischievous hooligan. So if I find that someone likes a sparkler, I'll probably take it off the beer engine. And, <laughs> and if, I, if I find out that someone doesn't like it, I'll almost certainly uh, try and use it uh, as I'm pulling the beer through the engine. Um, sparklers are... Uh, to this day, they're fairly controversial. They were developed in Yorkshire back in the early 80s. I think Tetley's might have been one of the first breweries to start using them. Um, uh, it's, in, in the UK, it's a bit of a north-south divide. You wouldn't see them. A tight sparkler would not be that common in, say, places like Kent, where uh, the drinker would prefer more of a, a looser head on the pint. Uh, while up in, in uh, northern England and Yorkshire, and then up into Scotland, tight sparklers are fairly common. Um, I think it really depends on, A, the brewer, and what their perspective is, and how they want the beer to be served and also the style of beer. I think if you've got a harsher beer, like a stout or a porter, and you want to soften the harshness, the astringency coming through from black malt or roasted barley, I think they, they actually can help a lot. If you have a delicate beer, like a Southern English bitter, uh, I think maybe you don't want to soften that character because it's already fairly uh, moderate to begin with, fairly subtle, then maybe pulling the sparkler off uh, is the right thing to do. One of the things I find fascinating is that it's you can take two factors, temperature and carbonation, and there's other factors, but those are the two major factors I think of. And when I drink a cask ale at a bar, that a little bit warmer temperature, the lower carbonation, makes me feel so much more comfortable drinking the beer. And it just, it feels more in line with, I'm gonna settle into the seat, melt into my chair, have this conversation, meet with some friends. Um, it just seems more suited to that social dynamic. And I like the fact that in the United States we're starting to see that, where the bars and the pubs are starting to serve a right. different function rather than, you know, you go to the bar and you're just looking to get wild or chasing tail. Because <laughs> for a married guy who's happily married and has got a kid, I go to the bar to socialize if I do go to the bar. So I want to sit down and have a cask. Lucretia, right. don't worry, right. he's drinking cask ale. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> cask ale. Yeah, you're safe. You're, you're okay. Yeah. Yeah. You're in good shape. So. After one year, I'm comfortable if our beers touch. So am I. That was really cool for me on a personal level to be able to come to a brewery that's had a lot of importance to me and my personal relationship to craft beer and home brewing and to learn something totally new. Yeah, I mean, not only was it a super fun brew day and just session, I mean, I, I, again, I learned so much from Damien about Cascale, something I'm, I'm really interested in. Um, and then to be able to take part in some commercial aspect of brewing, yeah. that's the first time I've ever done that. And I was very nervous. Um, and I was really proud of us to, you know, do what we needed to do. It was nothing difficult. It was very homebrew scale, homebrew kind of related uh, procedures, but... It wasn't homebrew scale, but it was the same kind of thing. Right, right. Fine. <laughs> Not only was the episode full of, um, you know, fun and, and, and technique and, and knowledge and then you're learning, but it really reminded me that whether you're doing a, a craft beer or you're doing home brewing, as long as beer is involved and you're passionate about what you're doing, it's fun. It's a, it's a lot of hard work, 
um, as we were put to the task and you got to remember a lot of things and you don't want to screw anything up just like in home brewing sanitation uh, following procedures measuring your ingredients is so important uh, but it's that same sense of satisfaction mm -hmm. um, and to kind of see that continuum to take from home brewing to the craft beer and then back again to is super cool and I think that's what we've done all year long is really talk so. about beer in that entire context you know in a holistic view of what great beer is yeah it's been an awesome year and I want to thank you and you Chip and all of you out there for making it possible all the comments and engagement you guys have had with us has been overwhelming and, and really just humbling um, I also want to thank all of our friends with benefits yep They've been supportive over this last year, and of course, a lot no more of them now than there were. <laughs> at the start. There are, um, and of course, Northern Brewer. Yeah, I mean, you know, we 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 don't try to push Northern Brewer really hard on this show, but you know, the truth of the matter is that Northern Brewer funds us 100%. So the best way to support Brewing TV and to make sure that Brewing TV sticks around for another year and another year after that is to make your purchases with with Northern Brewer. So if you like watching, please support Northern Brewer. And like Jake said, make sure they know we sent you. With all that said, Mike, there's only one thing left to say. Happy anniversary? No. no. All for brew? Brew for all. Cheers, man. Cheers. Cheers, Chip. Cheers to all of you out there. Kilo's gonna grab that thing by the head. <laughs> yeah, talking turkey. All for brew, brew for all. Well, sorry. <laughs> Howdy. <Welcome. Bounty. laughs> you go. Stepping on my lines, man. You go. You go. Welcome to Brewing TV. Hang on, I gotta sound happy. <laughs> <laughs> all for casks. Casks for all. Hear me now. Chip wants me to talk louder. I think you should all just listen the f up. <laughs> SOBs. For life. For life.